Jody Perrick was born on September 2, 1996 in Constantine, Michigan. She had one older brother and was raised by her mother, Valerie, who was always known as Joe. Nothing stands out about Jody's early years. Like many kids her age, her time was spent between school and family, and she loved riding her bike and her many friends in the neighborhood. Jody had an easy smile and loved animals and playing basketball. Her favorite saying was, quote, Love is like a hug, so hang on to it. She was known for her big heart and generosity, which only seemed to grow as she got older. After a family trip to Chicago, Jody told her parents that she wanted to become a hairdresser when she grew up. When she was asked why, she told them that after seeing the homeless people in the area, she realized that when people feel pretty, they also feel better about their lives. Jody and her family could never have predicted how unpretty her own future was going to turn out to be. This is Monsters. It was 5.45 p.m. on Thursday, November 8, 2007, when Jody's mother began to worry that she hadn't returned from a visit to her friend's house. Jody was 11 years old, and one of her favorite things to do was ride her bike around the quiet streets of her neighborhood to visit her friends. Joe set her daughter a curfew of 5.30 p.m., so she would always be home in time for dinner and before it got dark outside. On that afternoon, Jody had ridden her bike to visit her best friend who lived less than a half a mile or 800 meters away. It was a trip Jody had taken several times before, and it usually took less than 10 minutes. Joe tried not to worry. After all, Jody was familiar with the route to get home, and she wasn't easily distracted. But as the minutes ticked by and the sky darkened, Joe became more and more concerned for her little girl. Eventually, she decided to go directly to the friend's house and find out why Jody hadn't come home on time. When she arrived, she found that neither Jody or her friend were there. The friend's mother told Joe that both of the girls were gone by the time she got home from work. Her own daughter usually walked to her scout group meeting on Thursday afternoons, and the two women agreed that it was most likely Jody had tagged along instead of going home. The mother invited Joe inside to wait until the girls came home. Except, when the time came, it was only one young girl who walked in the front door. The friend told Joe that Jody hadn't come with her to scouts. She had left on her bike in time to make it home before curfew. In that moment, Joe knew for sure something terrible had happened to her daughter. She immediately called the police and reported Jody missing. Then she called friends and family to let them know she needed help to find her little girl. When she hung up the phone, Joe headed out onto the streets to begin the search. She stopped by the homes of Jody's friends and their extended family and asked anyone she met if they had seen any sign of her daughter. Constantine in Michigan has a population of less than 1,000 people and news of Jody's disappearance spread quickly. Searchers from all walks of life spilled out onto the streets to look in the parks, along the banks of the St. Joseph River, and in nearby fields. They looked at all of the places Jody was known to be familiar with. She wasn't at her school, or at the church, or at any of her friends' homes. Despite their significant efforts, after several hours of intensive searching, no one had found a single sign of Jody or her bike. By that point, Joe was understandably beside herself with worry and at a loss as to where to look next. That's when she overheard a friend of the family ask if anyone had thought to check the cemetery. She had heard the friend repeat the suggestion a couple of times in the course of the conversation, but no one had acted on it. So Joe took it upon herself to head back out into the night. It was 10.30 p.m. when Joe arrived at the cemetery. As you'd expect, it was dark and most of the headstones weren't visible with the only illumination coming from a couple of faraway streetlights. Despite the gloom, as Joe pulled into the parking lot and looked out of the window, she immediately noticed something that didn't belong. In the darkness, she could make out the shape of a child leaning against a headstone. Joe leapt from the vehicle and ran straight towards the shadow. 
There on the ground, propped up against a random headstone, was the motionless body of her daughter. Lying in the dirt next to her was her beloved bicycle. Joe let out a heart-wrenching scream and cradled the little girl in her arms. She kissed her head and begged her daughter to wake up. Jody looked angelic, with her long lashes resting peacefully on her cheeks and her lips just starting to turn blue. But she wasn't breathing and her body was cold and lifeless. Even though Joe's mind couldn't grasp the fact, it was clear to her that Jody was dead. She would later comment, quote, She looked like she was sleeping. Her eyes were closed. Her mouth was closed. She was beautiful. Moments later, an officer appeared in the parking lot at the cemetery. It was the same family friend who had mentioned searching there in the first place. He had followed Joe to the cemetery and heard her cry out when she found Jody. He rushed towards the sound of her screams and saw Joe on the ground in the dark, cradling Jody's lifeless body. The officer had enough experience to know that Joe would be destroyed by her child's death, but he also knew he needed to preserve the scene. He was well aware that 11-year-olds don't just die for no reason, and everything on and around her body would be considered evidence for the future investigation into her death. Eventually, as paramedics and police officers began to swarm the cemetery, Joe was convinced to let go of Jody's body for the last time. Officers cordoned off the area around the cemetery and a scene investigation got underway. Meanwhile, words spread through the small community that the girl they'd been searching for had been found, unfortunately dead. Right away, investigators sensed that something about this case was peculiar. Jody was found fully clothed, and there was no obvious sign of any injuries to her body. There was no blood and no bruising. It was almost as if Jody had simply sat down against the headstone and gone to sleep. Forever. Given the relative serenity of the scene, there was a possibility Jody had died from natural causes. Keeping an open mind about what had happened to Jody wasn't something Joe ever considered. Right from the moment she realized her daughter was dead, Joe believed that something had happened to her on the ride home from her friend's house. Joe wasn't shy in telling officers that she believed Jody had been kidnapped, murdered, and dumped in the few short hours between when she left her friend's house and when she was found at the cemetery. Strangely, some members of the community suggested that maybe Jody had ridden to the cemetery herself, or maybe she had gotten a fright and died of an undiagnosed heart condition. But Joe knew that there was no way Jody would have ever come to the cemetery of her own free will. Joe recalled how much Jody hated going there. She didn't even like driving past the area. Whenever they did, Jody would tell her mom she was scared of the place because it made her feel weird. Maybe she had a sixth sense about her future connection to the area. Or perhaps it was just a child's natural fear of the unknown. Either way, Joe was convinced that Jody had not ended up in the cemetery by her own choice. Thankfully, investigators decided to treat Jody's death as suspicious until the evidence told them otherwise. They began the investigation by talking to the young girl's immediate family while the crime scene was still being processed. We all know that the person most likely to hurt a child is someone close to them, and there's no one closer than a mother or sibling, so officers took Joe and Jody's older brother, Brian, to the station for questioning. Both Joe and Brian spent hours providing detailed explanations for their movements on the day Jody went missing. They denied any involvement in her death, and neither could come up with the name of anyone who would want to harm her or their family. After officers spoke to witnesses, they were able to determine that Joe and Brian's alibis checked out and they were ruled out as suspects. Meanwhile, Jody's body was removed from the cemetery and taken for an autopsy. The medical examiner confirmed that Jody's cause of death was manual asphyxiation. In the case of manual strangulation, bodies show signs of bruising or hemorrhaging around the neck and throat. But asphyxiation is suffocation that doesn't always require force to be applied to the airway. Jody's body showed no external signs of violent trauma, but she did have abrasions on her wrists, which hadn't been visible when her body was found due to the fact that she was fully clothed. The marks on her wrists were consistent with her having been handcuffed or tied up at some point before she was murdered. Contusions were also found on both of her nipples. To add to her family's horror, there was evidence Jody had also been sexually assaulted. 
According to the autopsy, Jody's time of death was 6.30 p.m., which was less than two hours after she had left to make the half-mile ride home from her friend's house. She was found wearing the black sweater and t-shirt she had gone missing in, as well as a bra and underwear, white socks, and tennis shoes. Her favorite white earrings were still in her earlobes, and a friendship anklet with multicolored beads was tied around her ankle. The coroner's report noted that while Jody was found wearing her socks and shoes, there was sand present in between her toes. That indicated her clothing had likely been removed at some point and she was redressed by her killer. The autopsy confirmed Jody had suffered a harrowing assault before her murder, but somehow the killer had left very little evidence about exactly what had occurred. From day one, there was a huge public interest in Jody's case. Despite Constantine being a relatively small area, it has some of the highest violent crime rates per capita in the United States. That unsettling statistic meant that the community was already on edge, and the disappearance of a young girl only added to the sense of unease and urgency. The local police found themselves under the national spotlight as media outlets descended on the town to cover the story. The fact that the victim in this case was a child meant there was intense pressure for the police to bring the killer to justice quickly. All of this context might have contributed to how the investigation went so wrong so quickly. The official announcement about Jody's murder withheld her cause of death. It's logical to think that might have been done so that when a suspect was interrogated, the information could be used to ascertain their guilt or innocence. But the lack of clarity only intensified the public's fears that there was a crazed child killer running free in their community, which increased pressure for results in the case. The community were right to be worried, but time would prove they couldn't rely on the police to keep them safe. Within days of Jody's murder, the police identified and publicly named their prime suspect. To the community's shock, it was none other than the family friend and police officer who had recommended searching for Jody at the cemetery on the night of her disappearance. Raymond McCann was a 46-year-old married man with three children of his own. His regular job was fixing trailers, and he proudly held a position as a police reservist who could be called into the force as and when required. He was known as a friendly guy who helped out his neighbors, doted on his kids, and coached their sports teams. Jody's mother had known Ray since they were both teenagers, and she had even dated Ray's brother at one point. As they got older, their two families began to spend more time together until they considered themselves one big extended family. When they had kids of their own, the children became best friends with each other. They were so close that on the day Jody went missing, it was Ray's niece she was visiting. No one wanted to believe that Ray could be involved. It was hard to imagine that a loving family man like him could have anything to do with the brutal murder of a child. And yet, everyone was also desperate to find out what had happened to Jody, and they trusted what the police were telling them. There was some relief that the crazed child killer they all feared had been apprehended, even if it was someone they had trusted so deeply. When Ray was brought in for questioning, he immediately denied any involvement in the murder or sexual assault of young Jody. But when he was asked about his movements on the afternoon Jody was murdered, his answers came across as inconsistent, which only seemed to confirm what investigators already believed. Ray gave a number of different accounts about the hours leading up to the time Jody went missing. In one version of events, he recalled that he had taken his sons to the Dollar General store in Constantine after they got home from school that afternoon. But when his sons were interviewed, they claimed that wasn't true. They had never left the house after getting home from school that day. Ray also denied owning any other handcuffs than the set he possessed for his role as a reservist, but the lead investigator claimed that was a false statement. Ray also claimed that during the time of the search, he had walked into a store and asked a shop assistant about whether she had seen Jody. But when officers spoke to the staff member, she was sure that the conversation had never happened and she hadn't spoken to Ray that day. Ray also never told the lead officer on the search that he had already visited the store, which was later canvassed by others involved in the search. Ray then claimed he had talked with a police officer that afternoon, but the officer also denied the interaction ever took place. Ray then said he had searched a nearby dam, but the police told him they had checked footage from the dam and Ray wasn't visible on it. 
With nothing to corroborate Ray's alibi, the police became more and more certain that he was their man. Their suspicions were solidified once Joe told them it was Ray she had overheard suggesting several times that they should take a look at the cemetery. When Ray was questioned about why he had told searchers to look there, he stated that he only suggested the cemetery because he was familiar with the area and didn't think anyone had looked there yet. He said he had already searched a local construction site as well as a baseball field without finding any signs of Jody and the cemetery was the next most obvious place in the area to look. Despite Ray's denials and there only being minimal circumstantial evidence tying him to the crime, the police were convinced he was the killer. They had his proximity to Jody and the inconsistent statements about his movements and they were determined to prove that was enough to demonstrate Ray was the cold-blooded child murderer they had been hunting. Now, all they had to do was find the evidence to back up their theory. But that turned out to be more difficult than they imagined. During the investigation, male DNA had been retrieved from Jody's body. Ray was determined to prove his innocence and he voluntarily provided a DNA sample when he was first questioned. When he was brought in for questioning again, he was told that the DNA found on Jody's body matched the sample he had given and that Jody's DNA was also found inside his truck. Ray was at a loss to explain how his DNA was found on the body or hers in his truck, but it didn't change his statement that he had no involvement with her death. Ray's denials were viewed as a stone wall by detectives, and yet no matter what they said or threatened him with, he wouldn't budge on his claims of innocence. So investigators decided to take a new approach. They told both Joe and Ray's family that his DNA was a match for the samples Jody's killer had left on her body. They doubled down by saying that the sand found between her toes had definitely come from his yard as well. Then they informed Ray's wife that he was going to be charged with murder. All of that might be considered standard in the course of a murder investigation, but they took it one step further when they told Ray's son that his father was using and selling drugs and that he might have been using his computer to find a gay lover. Looking back, it's easy to see that they hoped to turn Ray's family against him and destroy his reputation. Also, that he would feel like he had no choice but to finally come clean about what he had done. Their plan worked, at least partially. Once the police had planted the seeds of doubt in Ray and Joe's families, there was no question in their minds that he was Jody's killer. All they had to do was wait for the police to charge him with murder. Except, they never did. One year after the murder turned into two, and then three, and four, and five years, and yet still no charges were brought against Ray. During that time, Joe gave a number of media interviews begging and then demanding that Ray come clean so that she could finally be given the closure she deserved. All the while, as the years ticked by, Ray was having interviews of his own, except his were with law enforcement. In the five years after the murder, Ray was brought in for questioning 20 times. He always agreed to the interviews and he never asked for a lawyer to be present. No matter how many times he was interrogated, he was always consistent about one thing. He had nothing to do with Jody's abduction, sexual assault, or murder. It will come as no surprise that the way Ray was treated by investigators didn't improve over the years. They used every tactic they had to try to break Ray down and convince him to confess. The police kept coming back to the critical piece of evidence which proved Ray was the killer, the DNA which was found on Jody. In one interview, Ray was repeatedly asked how his DNA could be on Jody if he had nothing to do with her death. Again, Ray couldn't provide any explanation until eventually he commented that maybe it had gotten there after he made contact with Joe when he tried to get her to put Jody's body down when he first arrived at the cemetery. He told them it was possible Joe had sat in his truck while the scene investigation got underway, which might explain how Jody's DNA got into his vehicle. The police weren't satisfied with his answer and they double-checked with Joe whether she remembered Ray coming into contact with her that night. She confirmed that Ray had never touched her or Jody while she was cradling her little girl's body and she hadn't gotten into his truck at the scene either. Once again, it all came back to their point that there was no reasonable explanation as to why Ray's DNA would be on the little girl unless he was involved in her death. 
The investigators also told Ray that they had evidence which showed he had been within 23 feet of Jody's body when she died, an oddly specific number. They refused to explain what that evidence was, and of course, they kept coming back to the CCTV footage which proved Ray hadn't been searching at the dam when he said he was. But that's not all they had against Ray. In an attempt to prove his innocence, he had agreed to go through three polygraph tests. His first test was inconclusive, but the next two showed signs of deception, at least according to investigators. In another tactic to try to elicit a confession from Ray, the officers offered suggestions of scenarios which might help to explain why he sexually assaulted and killed an 11-year-old. They suggested that maybe it was an accident, or maybe Ray had a mental break and had blacked out and killed Jody. But even that didn't work and Ray stuck to his story. To everyone paying attention to the case, it seemed like the police had pretty convincing evidence to prove Ray was Jody's killer. And yet, despite their relentless efforts, Ray hadn't changed his statement once and they never actually followed through with filing charges against him. By the time Ray had been brought in ten times, he told the investigators, quote, You want a confession I can't give you. Didn't find her. Didn't put her there. Didn't kill her. Eventually, in 2012, five years after Jody's death, the lead investigator, Brian Fuller, decided to try one final tactic. He was sure that this would prove to be the turning point in the case and would guarantee him a conviction. He set upon a cold case team which reopened the investigation into Jody's murder. Ray was brought back in for yet another interview and confronted with the same line of questioning. Then Brian subpoenaed Ray to testify under oath about his whereabouts on the day of Jody's murder. Ray retold the story of his search of the dam and mentioned searching the cemetery because it hadn't been looked at yet. That testimony was then compared with his 20 earlier statements about what he had done on the afternoon Jody was taken. There were discrepancies between the recollections, especially in relation to the search of the dam. Brian had testified that the dam footage proved Ray had never gone there on the day of the murder. That and the inconsistencies in Ray's testimony meant that in 2014, Ray was arrested by police as he drove to the hospital to meet his newborn grandson for the first time. Except the arrest and subsequent charges weren't for murder. No, Ray was charged with five counts of perjury. In the state of Michigan, perjury carries a life sentence when it's in relation to a capital murder case. While Ray might not have been charged with murder, he was facing the same sentence as if he had been. The charges came as a relief to those following the case. Ray might not be convicted for the crime they were so passionate about, but he would still be locked up and the community would finally be safe. While Ray sat in jail awaiting trial on the perjury charges, he realized that there was no point fighting a police force that was determined to convict him for basically anything. From his perspective, if there was footage showing he had never gone to the dam, then the jury was likely to find against him even though he believed his statement was true. In 2015, Ray pleaded no contest and was sentenced to 20 months in prison. He later stated that he knew the detectives would stop at nothing to convict him of something, so a plea of no contest would be the fastest way to get back to his family. He met his newborn grandson for the first time while incarcerated. He commented, quote, It was so hard seeing him for the first time through glass. While 20 months in prison is nothing like the 20 years that the community thought Ray deserved, there was at least a small taste of justice for Jody's family. Despite Ray never being charged with Jody's murder, everyone involved believed he was the killer and his imprisonment meant that their children were safe. Except they weren't. It wouldn't be long before everyone realized that they had been wrong from the start. By focusing all of their efforts on Ray, a child killer had been left to walk freely amongst their children. Now that Ray was locked up, the real monster was ready to attack again. On July 28, 2017, a decade after Jody's murder, a 10-year-old girl told her parents a terrifying story about being attacked on her way home. She told them that as she went past a house down the street, a man had asked her to help him move something in his garage. When she went near the man, he pulled out a knife and covered her mouth with his hand. 
He tried to wrestle her to the ground, and she had seen him reach for an extension cord. When he looked away, she took the opportunity to wriggle free from underneath him. She was able to run home and tell her parents what had happened. The girl's parents immediately notified the police, and she was asked to lead them to the house where the attack had taken place. She led them to an address in White Pigeon, just 7 miles or 11 kilometers from where Jody had lived and died. The home belonged to Daniel Kevin Furlong. Daniel was a father who worked as a youth sports coach, just like Ray once had. He appeared to be just like any perfectly average family-oriented guy, but behind the mask, Daniel was hiding a dark secret. When his DNA was put into the system, it returned a hit for an unsolved crime in Constantine. I'm sure you've made the connection, but it was a match for the DNA found on the body of Jody Perrick. Now the police had a conundrum. If Dan's DNA was a match for Jody's killer, what was the situation with Ray's DNA? Had two separate DNA profiles been found on Jody's body? Or was something much more sinister at play here? I think you know by now it's always something more sinister. It turns out that Ray's DNA was not a match for the DNA found on Jody's remains, and it never had been. The police knew from the start that the DNA didn't belong to Ray and that he likely wasn't involved in her murder. And yet, they consciously chose to ignore the evidence and they lied to try and convince him to confess. But the DNA wasn't the only evidence they lied about. The video footage that they claimed proved Ray wasn't searching at the dam like he said was actually recorded from a building located a block away. It would never have shown him if he had been where he said he was. Brian Fuller had viewed the footage several times during the course of the investigation and he was well aware of the location of the camera. As for the evidence Brian said proved that Ray was within 23 feet of Jody's body, well, that simply doesn't exist. There's no such test that can prove if someone was in a certain radius of a murder. In fact, everything they said to Ray in those 20 interviews was made up. It was all lies they told with one intention, to scare Ray into confessing to a crime that he didn't commit. In the United States, it's perfectly legal for the police to lie to a suspect during an interrogation. They can say whatever they want if it serves to get the results they're looking for. They can make up evidence, mislead suspects, and produce fake test results. When a suspect lies, it's perjury, but when the police lie, it's legal, acceptable interrogation methods. It turns out that it's not uncommon for the pursuit of justice to be anything but just. Now, the police might tell you that it was all done with good intentions. Except in Ray's case, the evidence proved that Ray wasn't involved, not the other way around like the police had convinced everyone. It's clear from viewing Ray's interviews that he is open and relaxed as he is questioned by investigators. He clearly wants to help and willingly answers every question he's asked. He calmly explained his movements that night, including visiting the dollar store and searching the dam. This interview took place three years after Jody's murder on November 5th, 2010. The first place I went was to... Oh, I need to Start looking around there. You went there by yourself? Yeah. So, that's before you went to the police department? I, honestly, I don't remember if I stopped here first or went there first. I'm not sure. I mean, Don Carmino, I'm not 100% on that. So you went to DNS? DNS. You went to DNS? I went inside. Um, I, I don't know how I brought it up. I just I said, there's, there's a girl missing. Um, asked them if I could go around the building. I went around the building. We are actually looking for a bike, um, but you know, <laughs> and then from there I left, got back to my truck, started going out back on the highway, looked to my right to see police car, which was Donker. So I went up to the red light, turned left, went around the block, came up to the, the, the south side of the park, and that's where Donker met me, gave me a flashlight. Okay, so, but originally when you were going through the park, you didn't have a light? No. <laughs> So did you ride with him from there? Or? Um, no, from there I went up to the dollar store, went around that building, 
went through the baseball field, diamonds area, went through there by the football practice field for rocket football. Then he explains the lead up to arriving at the cemetery and the moments he heard Joe's screams as she discovered Jody's body. What did you say about the cemetery? I said, when we're down there, I said, okay, let's go check the cemetery. You know? Why did you say that? Because we checked it everywhere else. You know? And so I said, okay, let's go check there. So I go down this road and up the street and get to Five Points, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And the old park there on the right hand side, I get out there, walk around, turn left, or, you know, up towards the cemetery, across the tracks. I turn left into the first one, first row. And I'm going real slow, both windows shining everywhere. And I'll, um, Ed, um, Ed uh, Steinbach, one of my friends, he lives right there in that house. He Which called, house is that? It's that big, big, huge house next to the cemetery. On Florence, right there, right next to the cemetery. Okay. Anyway, he called me and I, I told him, I said, hey. He, he called you? I think so, because he seen me. Seen the truck, me put her in there, I'm shining everywhere. He was out in his balcony thing. His line, that thing that was kind of closed in, he called it his lion's den or whatever. But um, he called me and asked, you know, and I said, we got a missing girl. And I think shortly after that, I heard a scream, pull up a little more, heard more screams, I turned to the right, and that's where everybody was. Once I seen everybody running out, I put the truck in park and jumped out, started running towards them. Um, what would you do when you got over there? I started running up towards them, um, seeing the mother holding her. Um, that's when I was on the phone with Donker, and as I'm talking to him, I turn around and there he is, right right there. Um, as I'm, I guess, Ed Molina said, as I was coming in this way, going up, running up there, Donkey was coming in the other way, I guess on the other side. This interview took place five months later in April of 2011. At this time, Ray retold how, on the night of the disappearance, he pulled over a vehicle which had several occupants. He noticed a child with blonde hair in the back seat, but he didn't take a closer look at the identity of the child. He told the detective that he continued to wrestle with the question about whether that child was Jody and whether, if he had searched the vehicle, he might have been able to save her life. And I guess this is going to have to be part of the trust factor with me. But, uh, Ray, I don't think you can stand on that box and say that you did your job. I know. So, I mean, if you see a somebody that you think is her and you're looking for her and you don't, Act upon that at you're, all. You're right. You're exactly and that right. is a failure. That is. I, 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 mean, I got a call. Yeah, like I said. Right. Yeah, I felt my mission, my job. You're right. I did. During that interview, he repeated the same story of finding Joe cradling Jody's body in the cemetery and cordoning off the scene. Then he spoke about realizing that almost immediately after Jody's body was found, the cops started focusing on him as a suspect. You think that they were looking at you as a suspect then? I don't know. I like to know pointing the finger at me. I mean, you think that they're just asking you questions because you're like I'm asking you questions? Well, we went in, yeah. I mean, we went in there and gave all the information what we had to whoever was in the trailer. Um, but I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, did, did they did they actually say that for some reason you are a person of interest? I don't know, Donker. Come up and mention right away. Well, hell, you mentioned cemetery earlier. You know, the next thing I know, something must have been said because the next thing I know, I'm getting down here thinking, okay, uh, Detective Lonnie Palmer, want to talk to me? Well, I don't know if this is the same room. I don't know. <laughs> but, anyways, <laughs> um, he started talking to me and it didn't even cross my mind. He, he read me the, um, what Miranda rights or whatever, and I didn't even think about that. I don't even, no, I didn't even get a second thought. And, you know, we we're talking just like me and you, you know, giving the events of the night, and all of a sudden he goes, um, we, you know, sister, we got, we got some of our, uh, took pictures, I think he said, of your hands. And then he left the room, and I'm looking at, I remember looking at my hands, and hands, that's right there, I knew, what the hell, <laughs> you know. 
they took pictures of my hands, me, and... It's clear that from the second Jody was found, Ray was the primary suspect and the investigation revolved around him from then on. Ray's behavior and body language in these interviews don't appear to be those of a guilty man. But by this point, the lead detective on the case, Brian Fuller, the same guy who later went after him for perjury, had spent nearly five years working to get Ray to confess. In a subsequent recorded interview three months later in July of 2011, Ray was interrogated by Brian Fuller again. Right away, the interview takes on a different tone than the previous interactions. The prior interviews were conversational and relaxed, and the detectives gave Ray space to describe his movements in detail. But this time, we see firsthand the aggressive tactics they used to elicit a false confession from Ray. The only possible way that I can go to bat for you is if you tell me the truth. Oh, listen to me. Okay. Listen to me. The evidence has come full circle, and there is a part of your story, a big part of your story, that is bullshit. Like what? Can you tell me? Can you tell me? First of all, what we're going to do, like I told you before, I, you don't know how embarrassed I am from my co-workers right now, because all I've done the whole time is say that you're a, a fucking good dude. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm the laughing, laughing stock of this whole place right now. Wow. The only possible way that that I can still have, have saved some face in this thing is for there to be an explanation for the lies that you've been caught in now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. <clears throat> I know exactly where you are. Well, tell me then. No, you also know where you are. That's the problem. Okay, I'm not going to put words into your mouth. I We have the whole case prepared. We have everything out there. Everything is there, and your stuff is wrong. You're I'm not trying to be rude to you at all, Brian. I know you... Or I, I, a home? I don't know where else where was I supposed to be. I don't know where else you were supposed to be either, but I know that you weren't home. The only reason that I stood in the freaking rain knocking on your door today was a courtesy to you. Because this is going downhill fast for you. I don't understand why. And the only, only thing that is going to help you is for you to be truthful. And I know, I've seen it myself. I know you haven't been. I don't know what happened. I know you're going to keep asking me that. I'm not going to keep asking you. I, I, don't no need, I do not need to ask you another question. Okay. Ironically, the detective stated this. I, I don't lie. I tell the truth. And there is absolutely no doubt that you put her there. He even pulled the Jesus card. What does Jesus say about things that go wrong? Would you, what do you have to do? You know what? I don't know if you believe in God. I hope you do. Sure but you know what? Someday we're all going to stand in front of him, and you guys are going to find out the truth. You know that? You guys are going to find out the truth. And I did not put her there. You know, one day we'll stand in front of the Lord. We'll all know. And I, and I guess... Hopefully me and you're standing by each other. I'm going to say, Ryan, I told you. Brian was happy to tell Ray whatever he had to come up with to get Ray to talk. But he didn't say anything about the fact that during the investigation into Jody's murder, DNA was collected from 300 residents. 600 pieces of physical evidence were collected. 1,700 tips were received. 3,000 interviews were completed and the case file was 7,000 pages long. None of it pointed to Ray being involved in the murder. The only links he had to the crime were that he had suggested searching the cemetery, he was the first law enforcement officer to arrive on the scene, and he had a connection to Jody's family. In one of the recorded police interviews with Ray, an officer is heard saying, quote, I don't know if he will ever just say the truth. He's going to have to be charged. He'll get so scared, he'll talk. 
As we now know, there was a more dangerous consequence to the unethical but perfectly legal way the police acted when they attempted to frame Ray. By focusing on him as their one and only person of interest, they didn't look at the other potential suspects who were living in the area at the time. If they had, they might have found Daniel before he could attack again. An investigation later revealed that at least 10 registered sex offenders lived or worked within half a mile radius of where Jody was last seen, but none of them were considered suspects in the murder. Notably, the father of the friend Jody had gone to visit had once been imprisoned for criminal sexual conduct with a victim under 13 years of age. And yet, from day one, Ray was the only person the investigation focused on. Fast forward 10 years and the police had found their man, Daniel Furlong. When they interviewed Daniel, he admitted that he was the one who had killed Jody, and he added that he had been planning on sexually assaulting and killing the girl who had gotten away. Further investigation into Daniel's background showed he had been living in Constantine at the time of Jody's death. He told the police that he didn't know Jody before that day, but when he had seen her riding her bike past his house, he decided to call her over. After that, he gave a brutal play-by-play -play account of Jody's final horrific moments. Notice the different tone of voice the detective takes when talking to Daniel. They're gentle and calm with none of the aggression they showed towards Ray. They even thank him for talking to them. Alright, well obviously Dan, you know why you're here today. And your attorneys have talked to you about everything. So we're going to kind of go through what happened that day. Um, I've obviously, since I've been here, been able to you know, learn a lot about the case and facts surrounding it. And you know, I understand that you had a good conversation for the most part with your family. It's just been, a, been one thing that's been eaten away at you, and, you know, I understand that what happened wasn't a good thing. John Dan knows, too, I just want to make it clear so you hear it. He knows that you guys agreed to do this to avoid media circus. Mm -hmm. So he appreciates it and the opportunity to see his family. So thank yeah, you. And that's why I asked that he's got to hear too. These guys all know you. And Dan, we know that good people do really, really bad things sometimes. And uh, I think know, I went to school with you. Not with me. May have gone with my dad. Who was your dad? My dad was. I had an uncle. That's my uncle. Okay. Yeah. So, so I went to school with him. And I grew up in Three Rivers and played little league and stuff. I mean, you know. I'm a local person, and you know the people around here, and you know how much us just learning the truth is going to mean to everyone. You know, it, it's an important thing for the family to be able to sit back and understand what happened. For closure, as it probably was for your family to sit and talk to you today. So, Listen as Daniel describes what happened that day. I started cleaning my garage out. Because <laughs> the voice called that weekend, they were in trash pickup for the community in Constantine. Got a bunch of shit out front, and there was still some stuff that I wanted to get out of my old garage without having anyone built. So I got got the stuff out. And later that evening, probably about. I don't know, it must have been at 5 o'clock or so. I seen this little girl riding up the street. And I thought, well, you know, I had been taking these pills called Santex. It's a, it's a drug to stop smoking and stuff. Plus it makes you hallucinate. And I asked this girl to come over to help me move some stuff. She got off her bike. Came up to the house. That's when I grabbed her, took her in the garage. She wasn't moving, she wasn't screaming, nothing. Like, you know, this was an everyday occurrence or something. Was there any penetration? Huh? Was there any penetration or anything? No, I didn't want to have sex with her, you know, like that. So I got her out of the boat. 
By that time, it was dark out. <coughs> and I thought, well, <coughs> got her in my truck. I thought, now what am I going to do? She said, will you let me go? And I said, I can't let you go, honey. So then I took her out to the cemetery, down on the ground, and I thought, well, maybe she'll catch her breath again. And I just, just took off. I think she was probably good at the end. Well, I don't know. Oh. At the cemetery? What? You said you had a, what kind of bag was it? Was it was a Myrie bag. I don't know. I don't even know why. I thought at that time I was panicking. Well, you know, so I just wanted to get out of there. Yeah. So I got in my truck and I left. Notice how casually Daniel talks about the murder, and how he constantly states, if I remember correctly, or if I'm not mistaken, as if he's talking about an incident that barely registered his interest. It took several more hours of interviews before Daniel confessed that he had in fact suffocated Jody to death before they left the garage. After killing Jody, Daniel returned home from the cemetery, tidied up the garage, and carried on with life as usual for almost ten years. All while Ray's life was systematically destroyed for a murder he didn't commit. In the intervening years between Jody's murder and Daniel's confession, Ray's wife left him, he lost his job, his reputation was destroyed, and he had little to no relationship with his children and the extended family he had once treasured. All of that because a flawed and biased investigation and detectives who refused to consider any alternative. Daniel's confession came as a shock to everyone familiar with the case. Since the first day of the investigation, they had all been convinced by authorities that Ray was Jody's killer. They believed there was no question about his guilt and that he had somehow gotten away with murder. And yet Ray had been innocent all along. During the interviews in the eight years since the murder, Ray was recorded denying his involvement 86 separate times. Despite Daniel's confession and all of the evidence that tied him to Jody's murder, the case wasn't over yet. Inexplicably, he was offered a plea deal. Ray was relentlessly pursued for years when he wasn't the killer, but when the prosecutor considered his options with the person who was actually responsible, he basically rolled over and played dead. They offered to drop all of the charges against Daniel if he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. That meant he wouldn't have to face justice for Jody's sexual assault or kidnapping. But that's not even the worst of this story. The police announced that Daniel had been a homestay host for at least 19 international students, many of them young women. They also announced that they were looking into the possibility that Daniel might have been responsible for several other unsolved murders of young girls, including the disappearance of Brittany Beers, who went missing in 1997 from South Dakota. In a search of Daniel's home, officers found a handwritten list of names. Those names all belonged to young girls who lived in the area. When Daniel was confronted about the note, he initially denied writing it, and then he said there was no reason why he wrote the names down. Uh, Dan, there is a list of girls' in the, names in the garage. There, there's a picture in the garage. There's a list of all the young girls in the neighborhood, their names. What was that for? I don't know why I had them all wrote down. I, I think you do. No, I don't really. I had, uh, you know, just, I had, I had them all wrote down, I don't know why, I just wrote them down. Well, how would you know their names? Well, I found it all later, you know, and so... Well, there were boys in the neighborhood, too, you didn't write any of their names, though. So. Well, I know. You don't because write young girls' names down for no reason. I thought maybe the one young girl would be, instead of... So, but how did you get the names? Did, did somebody tell you their names? My grandkids told me. Told you the names of. Right. So, were you waiting to do this? Waiting for an opportunity for one of these girls to make themselves available to do this again? Well, I had a plenty of opportunity because all these girls were in my house, mm -hmm. hanging out with you. Well, yeah. But there were other people there. So, were you waiting for an opportunity when you were alone? Right. So. He also said he hadn't heard any more girls in the eight years since the murder because of flashbacks. Well, I'm telling you, I didn't do it to yeah, How many uh, exchange students do you have at your house? Nineteen. How many of them are female? Twelve. 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 Twelve.
Well, how many of them did you have urges for? None. Explain to me this. How is this possible? I don't know. I thought about having sex with one of them, but I didn't have it. Because what's called it, it goes back to the international people and say he, he had sex with me or whatever. You could just kill her. Well, I'm not taking a fall for another girl, I'll tell you that now. Because I didn't do it. You're, you're, not, you're only going to tell us what you've done. That's the purpose of this. Is to tell us what you've done. Everything, completely, fully, truthfully. I killed Jane, that's it. I didn't kill anybody else. That's how I'm God true. It was only later that Daniel admitted he had spent all summer adding names to the list and he planned to abduct, sexually assault, and kill all of the little girls. His latest attack was triggered by the fact that he had seen the news about Ray being the primary suspect in the case and being put away for perjury in relation to Jody's murder. That's when he knew he had gotten away with it for good. With that weight lifted, he was encouraged to do it all over again. When the little girl walked past his garage, he knew his moment to act had come. Disturbingly, part of Daniel's plea deal in Jody's case included immunity for any other crimes he admits to while in custody. To date, there has been no confirmation of Daniel's involvement in any other murders or disappearances. Joe and her family were not consulted on the plea deal and they say that they would never have agreed to a second-degree murder charge. Jody's mother read a written statement to the court at Daniel's sentencing where she said, quote, how has this kidnapping, rape, torture, and murder and finding my daughter's body in the cemetery affected me? For eight years, I had to live my life not knowing who killed my baby or why. Daniel was sentenced to 30 to 60 years in prison for Jody's murder. He will not be eligible for parole until he's 95 years old. The charges dropped for his plea were felony murder, unlawful imprisonment, and second-degree criminal sexual conduct. The only explanation Daniel ever gave for his motive to murder Jody was that he doesn't know why he killed her, except that he had urges. He also told the detectives he felt 500 pounds lighter after revealing the truth about what happened to Jody. Well, how nice for him. This is the closest Daniel came to expressing remorse or regret for the murder. Are you sorry for what happened? Yes, I am. Very sorry. How, how, how do you express that? And you, while you're trying to be secret about everything, and trying to keep your own self-preservation and not get caught, right? Right. How, how are you expressing any of the sorrow that you're saying you're having? I don't know. Really, I don't. I have a good feeling all of Every time I'm on past that cemetery. You can't do it? You can't go there? Nope. Did you go visit any of the vigils or anything like that? No. Why? Just uh, a reminder. A reminder of what? A reminder that I killed it. Even with Daniel Furlong's confession, guilty plea, and conviction, Ray's ordeal was far from over. He was still incarcerated on perjury charges when Daniel confessed to Jody's murder. A few weeks after Daniel was charged, the Constantine police chief visited Ray in prison. Ray thought and hoped that the visit from his old boss was to apologize for having put him through so much trauma all on false pretenses. But instead, the officer told Ray of his belief that Ray and Daniel were friends and that they were in on the murder together. Talk about some flat-out fucking stubbornness right there. Ray was only released from prison when he became eligible for parole in 2015. During his time in prison, he was a target of violent attacks because he was a police officer and because he was associated with the brutal murder of a child. During his first week of imprisonment, he was dragged from his bunk and struck in the head with a padlock while another inmate tried to gouge out his eyes. He lost 60 pounds or nearly 30 kilograms and continues to suffer from depression and paranoia even after his release. And in the end, he didn't even commit perjury. The police just fucking lied. A few months after Ray's release, he was approached by the same lawyers who had worked on the Netflix show Making a Murderer, as well as attorneys from the Michigan Innocence Clinic. 
They all agreed that Ray should never have been charged with perjury and they attempted to have his conviction overturned. From their perspective, the so-called inconsistencies in his statements were a result of the lies officers had used during his interrogations. The lawsuit alleged that Ray was the victim of a corrupt scheme by the police and that they had taken their interview techniques too far when they interviewed Ray. But the original prosecutor who had first brought the charges against Ray defended his actions. Of course, because these people are the most stubborn people on the planet. He stated, quote, Law enforcement officers use a variety of methods to either eliminate or identify individuals involved in a crime. I stand behind everything my office and the police did. In 2017, Ray was finally able to clear his name when a judge overturned his perjury conviction after his case was taken to the courts by the Innocence Project. The critical evidence in the case was the discovery that the video footage from the dam was recorded from a block away which the officers were well aware of, long before they threatened Ray with it. Ultimately, Ray was awarded a meager $40,000 as compensation for the time he spent in prison. His lawyer later commented, quote, This was one of the worst cases of police tunnel vision I've ever seen. The detectives were so desperate to solve this case and so blinded by their belief that McCann must have been involved that they ignored powerful evidence pointing to his innocence. In fact, even after Furlong was identified by DNA evidence as the killer, the authorities went to McCann's prison and tried to pressure him into admitting that he and Furlong were accomplices. Again, McCann refused to falsely confess to knowing Furlong. This case highlights the dangers of how strong tunnel vision can be. Here, the tunnel vision had such momentum that even after DNA and Furlong's confession completely exonerated Ray, it still took years and the force of two law school legal clinics to finally have his conviction vacated. Despite being cleared of any involvement in Jody's murder, the damage to Ray's life had already been done. One of his children supported him throughout the case, but the son who had been fed lies about his father no longer has a relationship with him. Ray commented on all that he had lost because of the police's pursuit of him as the killer, saying, quote, I lost a lot. I lost my family. I lost my son. I've only seen him three times since I got out. I missed my grandchild's birth and my son's high school graduation. Even my sister turned against me at the time. I lost a lot of friends. Ray never returned to Constantine and had to start a new life in another town. He now only goes back to the area when he wants to visit his deceased father who is buried at the same cemetery where Jody's body was found. Sometimes he's stopped on the streets by people who once believed he was the killer. They say, hey, I'm sorry I crucified you before and now I see what really happened. Ray says, quote, they're truly sorry. You can see it in their eyes. I truly am thankful for that. In September of 2023, Ray sued the lead investigator in the Jody Parrott case, Sergeant Brian Fuller, for malicious prosecution and due process rights violations. He alleged the sergeant pursued him, lied to him, and falsified information to secure a conviction against him despite the evidence proving that Ray wasn't involved. Under oath, the sergeant admitted that he had lied throughout the investigation, but that the lies were, quote, what was best for the investigation. I wanted to solve the case. During his testimony, Brian Fuller admitted that at one point the investigators believed Ray's teenage son might have been involved in the murder and that Ray was helping to cover it up. The court was shown footage of Brian interviewing Raymond McCann III about a supposed crush Jody had on him. In the footage, Brian can be heard saying Jody was a tramp who had come on to the teenager. Now, let's pause real quick to fully take that in. He called an 11-year-old murder victim a tramp. Brian's lawyers also argued that he had followed the correct process in charging Ray with perjury and that he did not violate his constitutional rights. Except he moved forward with the perjury charge despite knowing that there was no camera footage that proved Ray was lying. It's absolutely mental gymnastics so Brian Fuller can sleep at night despite royally fucking an innocent person. You know, the opposite of his job description. Thankfully, the jury sided with Ray and ruled in his favor. He was awarded $14.5 million in compensation. He stated, quote, They can't get away with something like this. They did me wrong and they know they did. I'm just glad it's over. 
After the verdict, Jody's mother was interviewed. She publicly apologized to Ray for all that he had gone through in the 15 years since Jody was found in the cemetery. She was convinced he was the killer simply because Brian Fuller constantly told her they had evidence which definitively proved Ray was responsible. In the wake of the truth about the DNA evidence and Daniel's confession coming to light, she realized how wrong she had been to think Ray was responsible. Ray has never received an apology from any of the officials involved in the Jody Perrick investigation, and I'm pretty sure he never will. This case has so many victims. Firstly, and most importantly, Jody Perrick and her family. But there's also Ray and his family, whose lives were changed forever, all because the police were determined to overlook the evidence in order to secure a false confession. And then there's the second victim, who fortunately got away from Daniel, who might have never gone through that ordeal if the investigators had simply done their jobs. At least the monster responsible for Jody's death is locked up, hopefully for good, but Sergeant Fuller remains an active duty officer on the Michigan State Police Force. I feel sorry for the innocent citizens he comes into contact with, and if the great state of Michigan has any sense, they'll eliminate the liability sooner than later. We can only hope. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.